Hey all, welcome back to the Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. I am Darren, I am your host, and today I've got my friends Kevin Liddell and Lloyd Capuccio back on. We're going to talk about food preservation, retort canning, and all kinds of different things uh, food science related. So I'll be right back with Lloyd and Kevin, and we'll talk about retort canning and food preservation. Smoking, grilling, getting hot and hotter. Hey all, I want to introduce you to a company I just started working with, Fresh Jack's Organic Spices out of Jacksonville, Florida. They're a small, family-run company that's fast-growing. I've tried a bunch of their different seasoning blends and spices, and I can tell you they are all fresh. All organic. None of them contain artificial flavors or sweeteners. None of them have anti-caking agents or preservatives. They all taste like they were just made for you yesterday. Check them out, guys. They're on Amazon in the link below. They have different sample packs, different blends. Like I said, they also have the individual seasonings and spices as well. Fresh Jack's Organic Spices. Check them out, guys. I love them. Well, thanks for joining us. We're back, Fire and Water Cooking Podcast. It's been a while since I've done one of these. Had to take some time off, but I want to welcome back Lloyd Capuccio and Kevin Liddell. They are my buddies. We're back to do a podcast and talk about just about everything today. I've had to take some time off. to uh, I started a new job, and it's riding me ragged. haven't had time to do a podcast lately, so I wanted to put one together with me and Lloyd and Kevin so that we can – just get back to talking about things we love to do. So welcome back, Lloyd. Aaron, thank you for having me again on the podcast. Love I'm sorry, it's here. Jamie. I'm sorry, Jamie, not Lloyd. I'm using my wife's account. She's got a better account than I do. Gotcha. She's a teacher, and, so. And welcome back, Kevin Liddell. He has got a haircut, so he's looking dapper. First haircut in 15 months. Good to be back. Yeah, it's starting to clear up the COVID thing, starting to, you know, clear up some. Everybody's getting vaccinated, you know, except for me and Lloyd. But hey, you know, Kevin's vaccinated. That's all that matters. <laughs> well, he's not wearing a mask, which is kind of nice. Well, well we kind of prefer of people, Kevin to wear masks. A lot, yeah. Yeah, a lot of people disagree with that statement, Lloyd. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we wanted him to wear a mask before uh, COVID came. So, Well, I, I have would help right now with the reflection off the top of his head. No. Yeah, I gotta. Definitely. I, need, I need some of that football blackout stuff they put under their eyes. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna switch it to gallery view haircut. so we can they can see us all talking at the same time. I we like the Brady bunch. <laughs> all right, so let's let's talk a little bit. I got a couple topics we want to talk about. Um, you know, we've all been doing a little bit different things lately, and one of the things I'm starting to experiment with, and I think Lloyd was trying to as well, is retort canning. Um, when I started the vacuum sealer Facebook group, I've gotten a lot of interest and in, a lot more interest than I thought that I would get um, in chamber sealers and especially uh, retort canning and mylar uh, sealing. And those are kind of specialty items. And I really never looked into it much. Um, retort cans, if you're not familiar with them. If you go to the store and you see those little bags of tuna that you can buy on the shelf, they're like a little aluminum uh, bag. This is actually a metal flexible can. Um, they call these retort bags and it's just like a, like a regular can that's got metal and plastic in it. And that's where you'll see a lot of the, you know, tuna and chicken and soups and stuff in these cans. And, um, a lot of people are use these for, uh, prepping, you know, for MREs, uh, uh, instead of using the glass jars, they'll use these, you know, to can with. And uh, so I'm actually going to start doing some of this. And there's not a lot of information out there uh, for people to look up on videos and stuff online. So I figured it would be something I can explore and 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 try out and see if it works. I live in Florida where we got hurricanes every year and all kinds of storms. The power goes out for days on end sometimes. So they you know, my wife's always wanted to have a lot of stuff, you know, stored up in case of emergency. And this would just, you know, this type of canning, it actually, it makes it so you can actually have more um, product without 
worrying about them falling and breaking. You know, if you, this was in a glass jar and, it, you know, you had something happen that fell off your shelf, it would smash and your food's gone. And they also, the glass jars take up a lot more room than, than some of this stuff. So you can actually have more of these and, you know, uh, store them easier. So there's a lot of benefits to it. Like I said, I've got a lot of questions about it and I got a lot of people asking me um, how to do it or what different kinds of sealers do it. So Lloyd, you kind of looked into it too. I know that you, you were looking into your vacuum sealer if it can do it. And so far it does not. I tried a bag or two, actually three bags. I got the uh, VacMaster VP321. VP the um, heat time, the max is three seconds. Initially, it looks like it's sealing, but after about 45 minutes, it comes undone. It creates a great vacuum, but it comes undone. I, I, need, I need plan B. Like you suggested, I'm going to contact Mac Master and see if I can get a, a different ceiling bar. See if I can swap that out. So I have two ceiling bars in my machine. You can buy we'll external see. sealers. You can buy ceiling bars that aren't built into so the machine I, as well. I saw that, and they're like 110 bucks. So what I could do, I thought, was seal it with the VP321. creates a great vacuum. It's sealed. You have like 45 minutes before it pops up and then then seal it down with the other bar. That's that's an option I've been, been considering. Yeah, you just got to be careful with that. I know is that make sure that you get a, a, at least your initial seal doesn't let any of the air in. And then if you can, you know, take it right out and then hit it with that other sealer mm -hmm. bar and just make sure it's going to be it. But the VAC 100 that I like and that I've used when I first um, got it and um, when they first started selling them JVR, they didn't have a um, seal bar that would handle the retort bags, but they came out with one, the manufacturer that they get the VAC 100 from, they went to them and said, Hey, we want a seal bar that will work for retort because they were getting a lot of requests for it as well. And, you know, so it's something that they don't have to produce a whole other machine for it. They just need to put a heavier duty seal bar. So this will fit in my VAC 100 I can take out the original seal bar and just place this one in and just up the uh, seal bar time or the sealing time. And they send you, when you buy one of these um, uh, bars, they send you the times for both oh, Mylar nice. and uh, Retort uh, bags. And they tell you what the cooling oh, wow. time is and the sealing time. So they, ha they, they pretty much give you what you need. They don't sell the Retort bags, but there's a couple places online and mylar bags. And if you're not familiar with mylar bags, they look similar to retort, but they're really not retort bags. They're um, more like um, the stuff that your potato chip bags you see, you know, like th they've got a little bit of metal in them, but they're not really thick. And, um, but they're a little bit, they're still harder to seal than a regular vacuum bag. But long term um, storage for like grains is what they're yeah, used stuff for. Like that. Yeah. Because it, um, they're, they don't let any light in and all that kind of stuff. So anything that's, you know, sensitive to light and stuff like that. So they're and mostly right. going to use oxygen uh, absorbers. Absorbers. Also. Yeah. I was just going to yeah. say that. Does a JVR 100 cost? How, what does a JVR 100 cost? 900. Seven, seven ninety nine. If you use the code fire and water. Ooh, that's not bad. Have a whole yeah. separate machine. Wife would kill me. But, <laughs> I mean, wife would kill me, but. Yeah, nice well, and that's separate. my that's that's my main chamber sealer. I mean, it it does everything I need it to do. I don't um, if I have anything really big that I want to vacuum seal, I just use the uh, the channel vac and just use the double the the bigger um, expandable right, right. bags. If I do a brisket or something, most of the stuff that I seal is, is I can fit in that and um, right and and have no problems with it. That term, so. my, my VP three twenty one, I just love that thing. I mean, I do three gallons of. <laughs> stew or stocks or, or three gallons it'll hold a, a liquid it's just amazing so this um if you don't have any, any of you either of you guys have done any canning like regular canning with ball jars oh, yeah. or anything like that okay yeah so the, the the process is very similar except for um you can use your like i said the vac uh, the chamber vacuum if it has you know properly equipped to, to use the retort bags to vacuum seal all the air out then you put them in the pressure canner, which uh, I went ahead and bought. And an American, I guess you got one of these too, Lloyd. The all I have the, I have the biggest one, the forty, the 40 one quart, forty one point five. But again, yeah. I'm the only guy that can lift it. Darren, you got to lift the weights. You could have got a bigger one. 
Yeah. So I've, these I've, are. I have the 16 and a half quart. So these are the, uh, I would say the Ferrari of the uh, pressure cookers. This is yes, not an Instapot. <laughs> this is not a cheap <laughs> Instapot. This is something, the one I bought, I bought kind of like the medium sized one and it was $300 yeah. on Amazon. And um, so they're expensive, but they are made to last you. They'll probably, Forever. yeah, they'll probably Forever. dig these up, you know, a thousand years from now and they'll find these complete intact and can use it like a Glock, you know, if you, if you look on uh, <laughs> fa- Facebook marketplace, you can find some of those that are 40 years old. I oh, mean, yeah. they're ancient. Yeah. And they, it's uh, worth mentioning. They do uh 10 pounds and 15 pounds too, based on the weight. You just have to flip it over. So have you, looked at yours yet they actually it's do 5 10 and 15 they yeah, do 5 10 it's and got 15. more on it oh it's got more than yeah. that on it it actually it's got like three or four holes on there you just kind of flip yeah it. i think kevin said five ten. i think mine's only yeah. 10 and 15 i believe I, i'd have to look at it um, i only i only but, use 15 anyway i never use 10 yeah. and 5 yeah i think uh 15 is designed for elevations above 2000 feet although i only use 15 also just to go because i think it's 251 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is going to so, kill yeah, everything. So, I mean, it's got, you know, these books that come with it can pretty much walk you through anything you need to do. And for what I understand, the retort um, process is very similar to the, the canning process. So the temperatures, the pressure, and everything is pretty much the same. The only thing I heard you want to do with the retort pouches is you want to make sure you stack them in there like we were talking about earlier. You stack them in there mm-hmm. a little tighter because you don't want them to, the bags can tend to expand when they're cooking and they can blow out the seams. But if you pack them in there um, a little bit tighter, you can avoid that. But you also, that means you need to cook them a little bit longer than you would if they were in a jar so that they can get through all the mass of all the food in there. So so if you were in 90 minutes, you'd do like 120 or something like that. Also, this is uh, <clears throat> your canner is better than mine because think about my canner holds 19 one quart jars. You realize how many bags I'd have to put in there to make yeah. it a tight fit? So I think like, actually uh, Kevin's can is probably better than all of ours. You could probably yeah. actually take, uh, you know, how the chamber vacuums have, uh, you know, they give you blocks of plastic to f- take mm-hmm. up space in there. You could probably yeah. do something like that, you know, put something in there to take up the extra put space. Just water, put some, put some, <laughs> uh, some canning jars in there with water. The lid on or something, yeah. Or just the weight it down. You can do that. Figure yeah. something out, yeah. But uh, it's interesting. I've been trying to think about what I would do with retort uh, stuff. It'd be fun to play with, but I don't necessarily see like play like, with exactly. I, I can't. I can't. Like my local Wegmans has beautiful yellowfin tuna, but I looked at it the other. It was thirty two dollars a pound. So you know, I can't compete with like a you know a two dollar pack of albacore from starkest it's already done in that you know, already done retort cooking um, it's more so of a trying curiosity to, it's curiosity yeah. is all it is it's, yeah, it's not practical to, for us no but like yeah. darren said it, it could be for you know her her you know power outages and mm-hmm. camping that sort of stuff um but it's, yeah it's, it's fun to play with it. I'm, I'm interested i'm gonna start i'm gonna play around with it so you did some canning uh before regular canning before you said lloyd right yeah, I have uh, chili stews, stocks, everything, and um, I loved it. Oh my god! I mean, I can get nineteen one quart jars in my pressure canner, and uh, go big, go home. So I <laughs> loved it. Uh, yeah, and I, of course I have a forty quart stock pot too that I can hold all my stuff. So yeah, now I remember my mom used to do some back when I was growing up, back in the seventies. She used to. She used to can a lot of different stuff. She'd she'd can, you know, fresh vegetables in the, you know, in the summer so we could have them in the winter because we grew up in upstate New York. So, you know, it was hard to find any kind of, you know, vegetables, uh, you know, that were fresh back then, you know, in the winter time. So she would, she had a pantry full of canned stuff that um, she would can, you know, during the fall. And uh, so she had a big pantry full of that stuff. So, but I don't really remember how to do it. I've never really done it myself. Mm. So uh, I never really had an interest to do it because I know it takes up a lot of room and stuff. And, you know, it's just as easy to go buy a bunch of cans at the store anymore, you know? Uh, (laughs) So, but this kind of intrigues me because it's something different. So something a lot of people are doing, you know, 
you know, preppers, if you want to say preppers, but people just, you know, preparing for, you know, storms and stuff like that, just to have some extra food on hand that can last without refrigeration and, and, uh, any kind of, uh, temp control, uh, for a while. And that's, that's the reason I'm looking at it. So a curiosity and take something we haven't done before. Exactly. It's something we haven't done before and it's something we can play around with and see if there's a, a use for it. And I think the way these bags kind of lay out, it's to me, they take up a lot more, a lot less space than, than these jars would. And it makes it a little easier if you um, don't want to dedicate, you know, a whole, closet full of uh, cans you can put four i'm looking at the boxes behind you you can put 40 of those bags in one of those boxes easily right yeah and uh and you can put all kinds of different stuff in it now that's another thing that i've seen that you know stuff like fish or chicken that cooks really quick you you kind of put it raw in there and then have it the pressure canner kind of cook it but Mm -hmm. stuff like pork and beef and any other kind of red meat they always suggest that you actually cook that beforehand and then finish it up in the pressure canner. So um, I guess cool. vegetables, you can kind of partial, you, partial cooking. Do either yeah. of you guys, uh, so you can can mm. uh, in a stock pot with boiling water. There are certain right. things you can can. You don't necessarily need a pressure cooker, but if you are doing low, a- low acid be, foods, if you're doing low acid the pH foods, is going to be below 4.6 though. Yeah. If you're doing foods, yeah, the, the pH is very important. So if the, it's low in acid, uh, then you need you need a pressure canner. Um, if you're doing a tomato sauce, you're fine. You can do it. You can do it in a in a stock pot. Although what they've talked about with tomato sauce or even tomatoes, the uh, the new tomatoes that are produced on the vine. Oh, they're um, doing lower acid. Yeah, it's lower acid tomatoes. Yeah. So now you have to get a pH reader, read it, or then you're going to use some sort of citric acid or add some. Uh, vinegar to it or lemon juice you gotta basically increase the acidity i'm glad i have a ph i'm glad i have a ph reader so do i (laughs) (laughs) gotta get up below 4.6 gotta get up below 4.6 yep just another tool to have i guess below 4.6 is is hard to achieve but you you do want to be safe there i think the dangers of canning are a little overblown uh, as far as numbers but they are there um you know they're probably i i haven't looked up the statistics but i don't think i don't think canning is is that as dangerous as many people perceive it and so it scares a lot of people off let me offer you this analogy i think going to a salad bar is more dangerous than actually eating food from a can or, or eating, going just to a restaurant just going eating, to a restaurant yeah eating, <laughs> eating bean sprouts from the grocery store right <laughs> oh yes very true. or going to chipotle <laughs> <laughs> they have it all the time where they get their uh, people are getting listeria from eating from their lettuce and all that kind of stuff but uh, i think it's just like any anyway, it's like with sous vide people are still you know they oh how can it be safe it's in the danger zone you know and all that you know oh, i've had people I actually had people and and the vacuum sealer group kind of comment on the post i did showing the canner and they're like Oh, this you you got to make sure you do it right because you know I don't think it's been fully approved by the FDA and blah blah blah. And it's like it can't be any more dangerous than regular canning. Yeah, and and why don't you go you know check in your cupboard and see if you have any pouches of tuna sitting in there? (laughs) Tell me, tell me the FDA FDA didn't approve it. Well, the FDA they're full of it. Sorry, they're full of it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of the stuff in the USDA. With a lot of the stuff that they put out there is over, over uh, a protective, you know, so that they can say it's like the the hot coffee warning on a cup of coffee at McDonald's. You know, they got to make the warning hot liquid, you know, big, so that when you spill it, you can't sue them anymore. So <laughs> I read an article where uh, the uh, FDA hired all these scientists to come up with uh, pasteurization tables for proteins. Um, and the scientists said, uh, for poultry, all you need is about a five log reduction, a five, uh, D log reduction, which is a hundred thousand to one or 99.9999% pathogen reduction, uh, for beef and pork and stuff like that, a 4.5 D log reduction. The FDA goes, thank you. We'll do a 6.5 and seven. a seven. Seven. Yeah. yeah. For poultry. <laughs> now think about the a seven versus a five. <laughs> Five is a hundred thousand to one. It's actually an, exp- is- it's, an ex- 
virtually an exponential, exponential. increase. <laughs> 10 million to one. And their reason, they're making you safer. Yeah. Now, but mathematically, you know, I'm actually writing for your viewers uh, an article on safety and sous vide. But mathematically, if you're cooking, let's say, poultry at, at 150, go from, let's say, a, a five to a seven is it, a matter of 13 or 14 seconds. It's, it's not significant. But I don't like it when the government says, we're going to keep you safer, so we're going to create these rules for you. Well, so, plus, like, you know, so the 40 to 140 thing they recommend, you know, the, as the danger oh God, zone. That's crap. You know, as, as we talked about it, 107 is the the average of pathogenic bacteria when they yes. pro prolificate the most. Some are better lower temperatures, some are better at higher, but that's the average. And so that you got four hours there. So if you're at 41 degrees, you know, which is in the danger zone, you, you probably have a few day, you have days for that food to be safe, you know? So to, to give you some, uh, some math, right? Um, so at 40 degrees, if I'm not mistaken for salmonella, it would take 1.8 years, actually, as opposed to 107 at four hours. So 107, let's say four hours for a certain log to be created for salmonella. But at 40 degrees, one point, I think it's 1.8 years or 1.3 years. I forgot the number. But it's significant. It's, it's significant. It's all crap. It, it's also well, it's just like it's the like fatality. The, uh... Fatality okay. rate for fatality rate for salmonella is less than one percent. Right. Yeah. So if you but, if you get it, you have less than a one percent chance of dying. Similar um, along the lines of the Costco steaks. I was talking to a friend. Oh of mine God. I had them over the other day, and um, you know they said, "Oh yeah, I love Costco steaks." And then they're like, "Well, did you ever read the label?" And he's like, "What do you mean?" I said, "Well, they got this big warning on the label because they blade tenderize their steaks that you need to cook all your steaks at one sixty five. That's like see what and he's like." Who the hell's going to cook their steak to 165? <laughs> it's like, nobody. I said, but they put that on there so they cover their butt in case somebody gets C -Y -A. sick. C-Y-A. Cover your ass. <laughs> I said, cover your ass. You know, who's going to buy a nice, thick ribeye steak and then burn it to death, you know, to make sure. So that... <laughs> what's interesting is if you think about HACCP, and, and Kevin can talk about this because you've taken the course, not to mention you're a professional chef, but in restaurants, when it comes to fish, Let's say salmon and tuna and cod. Um, there is no pasteurization tables because uh, people don't like that. No one wants a, a, a fish cooked at 165 degrees. <laughs> so you will get a fish that's probably served you at 125 and it's not pasteurized, but the government's okay with it. In their literature, it'll say 145 for 15 seconds is suggested. But that's not even based on science. That's just like, well, what the hell? Let's throw a number out there. It's all bull. Yeah, my sushi yeah. bar doesn't cook their fish very much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but although, a lot of it, though, although, is frozen, though. They throw frozen they the it is. I'll, I'll tell you what, though. I, there are a lot of top-end sushi restaurants. And the one I have near me, which is very good, uh, they get in fresh fish. And they serve it raw, which I believe is illegal. Theoretically, it's illegal. yeah. According I mean, to the it, FDA, it's, you got to freeze it. So yeah. So one of the things that um, you know we had the my power went out again, so we had to cut this off again. But you need um, a generator. One of the uh, yeah. the biggest toxins or you know pathogens that is worried with canning is botulism. It's not really yeah. salmonella or uh, any listeria. It's more botulism, you know, and that's uh, one of the big worries because it's you can really you know mess you up and that's when you see like uh, i don't know if you ever watch uh hoarders that show hoarders <laughs> my wife watches the show hoarders and it's people that's like, that, they, they that's keep insane. everything you know but there was this one show where the woman kept food in her refrigerator that was oh. like for like five or six years and she would the, her whole determination and whether she could eat it or not was whether the bag was poofy or not <laughs> <laughs> so if nice. it was poofy with botulism growing and you know exploding out then then it was okay to eat it was just one of the most disgusting things i've ever seen but what a great natural selection yeah, natural selection at, at its best yeah. <laughs> that was our you know i know it's you know yogurt and it's been in there for six years but it's not poofy so i can still eat it so oh, yogurt's supposed to have bacteria yeah exactly. <laughs> well so. think about it uh 
penicillin. Yeah. Probably going to help her. She gets the flu. I'll eat some yogurt. She can eat the bread, the moldy bread. That is Check penicillin. <laughs> hey, I'm going to self prescribe. Right. So what else you've been talking about? You so you're writing this whole new uh, blog. You said, uh, Lloyd. Yeah, it's a new article on food safety, and it's it's unfortunate because when you get into one subject, you open up this can of weeds, and 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 I'm wordy, I'm long winded. Everything I do is just, no. it's not, it's not. <laughs> oh, I'm heartbroken. The kosher dosha I... blog. Every every <laughs> every article is in and of itself. It's an hour to read. read. Well, well, and then you got to read it again because you got to, you can't understand half of it in in one reading. I consider my audience and I, I try to accommodate the lowest common denominator, you Darren. So, (laughs) so I make it very easy to read. So I, I figure if the layman who doesn't cook, doesn't know anything about food can understand what I'm writing, then I'm, I'm, I'm a success. Hmm. You know, Fish but, salt, um, good. Mm, yum, yum. Me eat. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, like, I'll give you an example, right? And, and I had to go back and edit something to make it even more clear. But someone said, um, wrote me and said, "Hey, my steak was too salty. I, I used your formula. I use zero point six percent of salt on my steak." Okay, so then I, he said it was way, way too salty. So I, I respond with, "Okay." Did you use a scale? Yes, I did. Did you use a gram scale? Yes. Did you use a gram scale that goes out to at least a hundredth or a thousandth of a decimal? Right? He goes, well, no, I use my regular gram scale. Well, that only measures up to one gram. So for it to even register, you're gonna throw a lot of salt on that scale. Well, I did the I I did what he did on my regular gram scale versus my my scale that only weighs up to 200 grams. And he put on like 12%. I mean, he put on so much salt. That's he, a little high. <laughs> it's like caked in it. <laughs> he put on so much salt because his scale was just not designed to, to measure in, in those micro uh, uh, amounts. So I, I try to dumb, I always use the word dumb down, but I try to make it easy to understand. So getting back into the food safety blog or article I'm writing, it just opens up a can of worms. So you, you jump from one subject to another subject to another subject. You get into like the, the uh, uh, I can't pronounce it. Clostridium. Um, um, Perfingrins. Oh, thank you. No, I can't no, that's pronounce a... it. Yeah, cl- Clostridium preferences. Perfingrins. Yeah, it's preferences. A it's a big word. Worcestershire sauce. Oh my gosh! Right. <laughs> so you get into you get into that. You get into the weeds, and you get you guys are reading a uh, footnotes. You got to get into the science, and and people make these these cases where you got to do this, you got to do that. I want to know why. Like, at least in the early 2000s, um, even into the mid-2000s, the recommended temperature for sous vide is 130. Do not go below 130. And But they never give a reason. So I'm exploring that, and I'm giving my opinions on why you can go below 130. And uh, a lot of my references, of course, is Modern Cuisine, Baldwin, reading Baldwin's notes and bibliography and, and going to their references. If you actually get into their references, holy crap. Uh, it's 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 mind mind uh, blowing. So one of the things that you know I was uh, <laughs> impressed with with Baldwin when I had him on the podcast was oh, he's a genius. God, he even said he he used one thirty because he know he was writing this for everybody. You yeah, know, people people that are deep into it like him and us. You know, we understand the science behind it, and we un- understand that we can go lower if certain criteria, you know, are doing it a certain way, but well, is he machine wrote, calibrated, he wrote it, for example, yeah. Yeah. If, if he wrote it for every, the every man and kind of what Absolutely. the USDA does and everything else is Absolutely. they, they do it over, you know, overly done so that they can make sure that well, know, somebody can say, you know, well, I did one twenty. you know, like every once in a while in the Facebook group, somebody will oh, those are, up, they're idiots. I did 120 degrees for 24 hours. It's like, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> or how about the guy does he does a three inch ribeye does 120 for two hours and says it came out terrible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, he decided. You know I what happened? Like, I don't like steak done sous vide. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. There's me. plenty of people like that. I did but, it once know, and I I Baldwin, did it wrong and right. it's oh my god not my fault. So, so Doctor Baldwin, Doctor Baldwin, the doctor now, um, is so thorough. So people quote Doctor Baldwin. 
they're actually not really quoting him. They'll take like a sentence. But if you go back and read his stuff, he, he's very, very thorough. But people fail to read all of his stuff. They, they fail to read if you're in your uh, compromise. Uh, um, he goes into great detail about how he did the math and everything. But people want to quote like one thing, one, right. one little sentence. And then use that as the, you know, yeah, this reference. is the, yeah. And then they, that's a, that's it. It's, you can't do anything other than that's, you know, that you got those type of people in some of the Facebook groups too, that they and some you got to use Baldwin and you got to do it exactly the way he says it. Well, you know, there is some, you know, <laughs> there's so also room. when he wrote that, I believe it was 2008, 2009, you know, as far as I know, my first machine I bought was in 2009 poly science uh the chef series uh, other than that I'm, I'm trying to think what was available uh, back then other than you know our crock pots with a pid controller let's be honest that's not accurate so yeah maybe 130 might have been really really good when using a pid controller because i know what i did i don't know about kevin what i did didn't taste very good it was hit and miss and as far as being safe uh, i don't know mm -hmm. um so 130 might have been appropriate back in 2008, 2009, because um, machines were not available. Now, of course, yeah. and all they the weren't as accurate. Machines, not, yeah, that, no, not at all. all. Yeah. So, okay. The so Hydro let's, let's, Pro, the Hydro Pro, for example, you can calibrate that. All right. Well, let's get back to uh, food prepping a little bit. And uh, oh, I love up. food prepping. I do big stuff, uh, you know. Have that. you guys ever done uh, freeze drying? I've, I've uh, I actually oh, just watched God. the video today of a buddy of mine who um, has a to. YouTube channel who I, I uh, uh, followed for a long time. I had him on my pod. He's one of the first guys I had on my podcast. It's called I Delicious do that. Bar Barbecue. He's got a dehydrate or a freeze dryer. <laughs> and he does a lot of prepping. Cheapest one's like $5,000. Cheapest one's like $5,000. Nice. He didn't say he how much his was, but he had one of those. It looks kind of like a dryer, you know, thing. You and can get uh, you can get them under three thousand dollars. Really? Yeah. For me, it's I'll all about room. I'll send you a link. They make different models, but the smallest model is under three thousand. I believe. I think it's you like twenty eight hundred. Do a lot. You can't do a lot, but I, I now tell me what's your opinion. Do you think the freeze dryer would be better than retort? I don't know because the thing I like more about the retort is I can cook the food put it in the retort and then just eat it like that. I don't have to, you know, rehydrate, rehydrate it. Or right. Right. Like that. That's true. Or both have know, I can eat it. I don't have to heat it up if I don't want to, I can just eat it right out of the package. If so, it's, if it's freeze dried, you know, you could probably eat it, but it's like eating styrofoam, you know, it's like, so, it's not going to be good. It's not like a jerky. It's more like literally right, right. styrofoam. It's freeze. It's freeze dried. As astronaut ice cream was a big yeah. thing. That, well, yeah. I got to tell you, I was up at chef steps, you know, for a tour and i was talking to all the guys grant and all and who's the other guy that's an amazing person anyway he made ice cream that was freeze-dried oh dear god it was amazing this eating freeze-dried ice cream was wow it was an experience it was an experience but yeah, I, I, mean, know, I, I don't think i want to spend the money on something like that i mean with doing uh freeze-drying you know i don't think i'm that hardcore of a prepper <laughs> <laughs> it's not for me it's not about preparation it's much i've never done it before what the hell it would right. just be cool to do if i had the if, freaking room if you had oh. like a huge garden uh i could see that being something that you might want to do mm -hmm. uh just because as far as the amount of weight reduction and space that you could save uh as opposed to canning everything would be impressive uh i believe they work through sublimation uh they use a oil vacuum pump and they create a bit of a vacuum and they freeze it and then they slowly bring it back up to temperature the water sublimates out of the product and that's what creates the freeze drying and removes all the water um but it's pretty neat i mean I, i've thought about you know i've looked at them for a while like i said i told you there was one you could get for like 2800 and i think it probably goes up to like 4000 for their biggest model uh for a home use one but you know that's pretty expensive <laughs> you know for something i'm not sure like i don't have a huge garden or anything so i don't know if there's any really I, if i really you know i'm not it's a not practical. practical i'm not it's a g whiz it's a g right. whiz thing yeah well yeah. like with this retort the retort thing i already have the the chamber sealer and this yeah actually they sent this to me to do some videos with it but it's 50 bucks so you know a regular person yeah. they if i spent 
you know, $700 on my chamber sealer. I spend another 50 for a specialized, you know, seal bar. And right, then I right. spend the money on the pouches. You do have to get the pressure canner, but you don't have to get the $300 pressure canner. Like I did, you can get cheaper ones out there for a hundred bucks and, you know, you can use that for other things as well. So you can get yeah. into it under, you know, a couple hundred bucks, pretty easy, you know, whereas freeze dryer, you know, I'm not going to spend even three grand on something that it's more of a toy to play around with the seat. I'm not going to sit here and freeze dry everything, you know, and just, you know, Hey, look, toys are cool. Some... <laughs> toy, toys are cool. I have a, I have a cheap dehydrator that I can use to dehydrate stuff, but, um, you know, that's I, got a com- I have a commercial line. I'm a commercial one. Of course you do, Lloyd. So, so, <laughs> so we, we all have an all American canner, which like we said, is the Ferrari yeah. of canners, but, uh, for a relatively moderate price, Presto, I think is probably the, yeah, the Presto is like a hundred bucks, 50, uh, yeah. 70 to 80, hundred bucks. I was but looking at good. those and, um, I was going to get one of those, but I said, you know what? I might as well. What if I, what if I was Lloyd, what would I get? <laughs> Well, you one of the, the things, one. <laughs> one of the benefits, one of the benefits of the All American is it doesn't have a gasket, like the press. All no, the other ones have right. gaskets. So, what kind of dehydrating have you done? You guys jerky and all that kind of oh, stuff. Oh God, I've done it all. Stuff? Yeah. I've done everything. You name it, I've done it. I've done fruits and and, and uh, garlic, black garlic. Take it to the black garlic stage, and then put it in your dehydrator for a long freaking time. It takes a long time, and uh, don't do it in your house. <laughs> no, black garlic, yeah, that's you got to leave that out. I did, smell, I did the it. I did smell it. is ridiculous. Well, initially it's kind of cool because it's like a pizzeria. Then all of a sudden it's like it's not a pizzeria. It's like it changes. It's, it's, it, oh god, it does. It's not so, a good uh, smell. Now I have the Excalibur uh, NSF all stainless steel ten tray dehydrator, and I've done just about everything in there from fruit juices to apples to jerky, of course. Um, um, I've just done everything and it's, it's great. Banana chips, of course. Now that kind uh, of lots stuff, of black garlic. That, that's um, kind of stuff you can actually use in your Mylar type bags. And so you do a bunch of fruit and dehydrate it. Yeah, absolutely. And then use your Mylar bags to vacuum seal all the air out. You wouldn't need any oxygen eaters in it. Right. Um, Cause you would just be able to vacuum seal it in a Mylar bag and then store it on the shelf, you know, you know, since, long- period of time as well it's worth mentioning also that you know <clears throat> if, if you get into dehydration or jerky my dog is in here um there's a lot of rules and how to reduce pathogen proliferation blah 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 do it at 160 10 minutes acid um, but what you can do if you wanted to is after you make your jerky if you were going to serve this or give it to a person who has a compromised immune system you can actually sue me the jerky to pasteurize it after the fact you know, still don't stack it very high in your in your bags you know maybe go an inch and then 135 for however long you want to, to pasteurize it but you could pasteurize your jerky so what other shelf difference. stable stuff have you done besides so you got you got the retorts or the canning that we talked about we talked about um, dehydration dehydration and and well uh, we can talk about sous vide a little bit so if, if you pasteurize if you sous vide you bring it to the point of pasteurization. You shock it properly with a proper amount of ice, and we've talked about that. Well, if your refrigerator temperatures are below 36.5, you're good for 90 days in your refrigerator with sous vide products. And I believe below 38 is 30 days, and above that up to 41 is 10 days. So I've d- sous I've vide done, cooking. I've done three months. I did a brisket. Uh, now that the refrigerator downstairs is pretty darn cold. I haven't measured it lately, but it used to be around 34, 35. Perfect. Um, yeah. And uh, I did a, a brisket. I took the flat. I separated the flat at the point, basically took all the exterior fat off of it. And then I did a dry brine for, I think, a week. Uh, and then I just let it sit and I forgot about it. I think I went three and a half months and I was like, geez, I wonder if this is okay. And, uh, I, you know, I was looking, I was like, going to see if there's a puffy bag or anything, any off odors. I opened see? it up and puffy bag. I, uh, and then I, I, Oh no, wait, sorry. I dry brined it. Then I cooked it sous vide. Then I put it in the freeze in the fridge and forgot about it. So it had already been pasteurized. 
um, and salted as well. And then I took it out and it, it was fine. Put it on the smoker. I was one of the best briskets, briskets I ever had. I did it. I think it was well, dry age then. Yeah, basically, I did it for like 132 degrees yeah. for well, 72 age, hours. Yeah. What age? Oh, yeah. so the, the log reduction. One, so the log reduction is probably 70. <laughs> oh, it's huge. Yeah. Or 70. Seven, oh, yeah. yeah. After after the seven day salting period, the dry brine. Uh, yeah, I cooked it for 72 hours at 132. So it was, yeah. Yeah. There so wasn't much going viewers, on in that bag. For reviewers, though, a log <laughs> of seven, right, is a 10 million to one. You know, so there's not enough freaking zeros. I mean, you know, a 70 log is, you know, one with, with, with 70 zeros, 70 zeros, zeros yeah. behind it. <laughs> yeah. So. Cool. Have you done any other kind of, what other kind of, you know, pr- pr- preserving is there out there that we're not even thinking about yet? Well, of course, you know, you can do mo- modified fish. atmosphere, modified atmosphere packaging. Uh, yeah, I would love you, to do that. You, you I, see I a lot of that. that. And those, those uh, more higher end uh, commercial type vacuum sealers where they, they have the gas that they actually put in the packaging with the, you know, when they're vacuum sealing it as well. So. I was going, it's a gas exchange and I was going to do that. I was going to buy the VP 545. That does the gas exchange and the price difference between the vp 545 45 was insignificant but um at least in the northwest pricing out the gas tanks is cost prohibitive you gotta rent them now is it nitrogen yeah. that it pumps in there or what what is the pump you, in there? It, there's a uh, nitrogen and there's also carbon dioxide and depending on what you're processing it could be either one or the other or a combination of two depending on the product and uh, there's some other uh, uh, measurements they use, but uh, either, either or or a combination of both. I think you can do carbon you know, monoxide. I think you can do carbon That's monoxide dioxide. as well. Monoxide? You, are you sure? I, yeah, I think you can. Di- uh, oh. when, when you see, and I'm not sure if it's the packaging, but when you see uh, like yellowfin tuna, that's you know frozen yellowfin tuna that has that nice pink color that you think that's that's Ooh. been that's been gassed with carbon monoxide because it's a it's a it fixates the myoglobin the myoglobin yeah yeah so i think you could probably i'm sure you could get carbon monoxide in there to fixate the myoglobin whatever you're you know if there's myoglobin in whatever you're packaging but it became, not, at least for me my research took me to where just you just can't go out and buy a tank and get it filled you got to rent them and right. it's a cost prohibitive it became cost prohibitive but it cost me like i think i estimated 600 bucks a year just to kind of rent this thing. I'm going to use every blue moon. You bake some cookies, you make some chips. You want to basically, it's a novelty. Right. You know, we want to seal a bag and have it like a potato chip bag. CO2 now, is going to be cheap though. CO2 is no, expensive. It's all cheap, but going to the person oh. that distributes the gas, getting the proper tank for your machine, they rent the tanks to you. That's how they make their money. You know, and then you got to have an account, and 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 uh, you got to pay per month. And another so, way to another way of preservation, which, which I do not know much about, and I need to research it, is high pressure packaging, which is pretty high neat. pressure. Well, explain that one to me. Okay, um, so you know, like those boxes of milk you get that are shelf stable that last for yeah, Parmalat, yeah, that oh. sort of stuff. So what they do is they package those under extreme i mean i think it's the equivalent of being 37 miles below the surface of the ocean oh those are the, those are the the pressures that they're using and it kills any path it kills everything because it's just you know i mean the the pressure is just outstanding um so obviously you're not going to do that at home because it probably takes, you know, like a $5 million machine to do that. But yeah. it's something I, I need to research a little bit more. It's interesting. And, and, I, and I only know of a few products, like I said, the milk, maybe a few others that they do the high pressure so packaging. It, it, it's it's a, a carton. Well, yeah. I, well, you've never I'm, seen Parmalat milk. It's in like a, it's like a sippy cup type of thing and uh, big, no, yeah, like, never. it's it's like a, it sits on the shelf i mean it's, it's like a core stable so you, yeah, you can sit, you know, sit that, on your shelf i for always years. wondered how they made that because it's like because milk goes bad you know yeah. pretty easy it just in refrigeration it goes bad like within a week i mean it's and it's nasty so you know i always 
you know, surprised me on how they could make, you know, a carton of milk shelf stable, you know, like that. So, so it's called high pressure canning. What's it called, Kevin? High pressure, high, high, high pressure packaging, I believe. HPP. High pressure pack. Okay. Yeah, because uh, it's like a regular this. milk carton, but it's a little bit thicker. It's not metal or anything. It's just it's okay. like cardboard, and but it's lined. I think it's lined with something. Well, maybe, maybe some kind of foil or something. Some sort most of plastic, milk. I think. All right, guys. Well, I think we're going to wrap this thing up. Uh, interesting conversations on food uh, preservation here. So um, well, I think I, you got to look- prove that we need it. You retort yeah. bags. I mean, you lost power three times, right? Twice. Exactly. Or three times. Yeah. <laughs> I lost Gosh. power. So, you know, you know, I got a lot of food in there. I'm going to start probably everything in my freezer. I'm just going to cook it up and retort it and have it stored in my closet from now on. So just in case, <laughs> but you know, it's fun things to play around with. I think um, it's going to be interesting to see the different kinds of, you know, things you can actually you know, do with it. Um, I'm interested to see how much, you know, people, actually watch the videos and stuff because like i said i was really surprised and i didn't know much about it you know when, when i started the facebook group well thanks for joining me guys it was really interesting talking about food preservation hopefully we can uh maybe we'll talk about grilling and smoking next time since Ooh, it's uh, the summertime so and lloyd's got to get rid of some of his uh, stuff so he can get new stuff so or his oh. wife won't talk to him anymore but thanks for joining me thanks for lloyd the kosher dosher make sure you check out the kosher dosher blog he's got a new new uh, post he says he's going to be coming out with soon with uh pasteurization and food safety, safety but, yeah. it's going to be great and kevin just keep looking for kevin every once in a while he'll get uh, in facebook jail and it's always fun to uh you know not talk to kevin on facebook for a while but then he comes back and we can make fun of him so thanks for joining us kevin and check out sous vide food and fun on facebook so yeah check out sous vide food and fun you'll find all three of us on there and check out everything else fire and water cooking i'll see you again on the next fire and water cooking podcast thanks for joining us guys bye guys bye see you bye Bye. well thanks for joining us guys hope you got some good information out of that make sure you follow the fire and water cooking podcast and make sure you follow the fire and water cooking facebook group and page and i'll see you again on the next fire and water cooking podcast